Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gateway webinar, Illuminated by Data, New Tools to Develop Financial Solutions for Smallholder Families. My name is Abby Augusta. I'm an editor for the Microfinance Gateway, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar. Our series of Gateway webinars allow financial inclusion practitioners like you to share lessons and attend online presentations and discussions delivered by the world's leading financial inclusion experts. Before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple of notes on logistics. Um, first of all, all attendees will have their microphones muted automatically. And in order to ask questions during the webinar, please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your WebEx session. We invite you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar presentation, and we will address them in the Q&A session at the end. To ensure that your question is seen by the moderator, please select all participants from the drop-down menu when sending your questions. And just a note, we have about 380 people registered for this webinar, so there's clearly a lot of interest, which is great. And we may not be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will share the panelists contact information at the end, so you can also follow up with them if your question remains unanswered. And finally, the webinar recording and presentation will be available on the Microfinance Gateway website after the webinar is finished, and we will also email the webinar recording to all participants. <clears throat> and with that, I will now hand it over to our moderator, Jamie Anderson. Thanks, Abby. <laughs> And thanks to everyone for joining us. My name is Jamie Anderson, and I'm part of the team at CGAP that works on financial innovation for smallholder households. As Abby mentioned, today our webinar is about new data tools to understand smallholder families and to develop financial solutions for them. And tackling this topic, I'm joined by a great panel from Insight to Impact, or I2I, the Microfinance Information Exchange, the MIX, and One Acre Fund. I've already had the chance to quickly introduce myself, so I'll invite each of our other presenters to say hello and introduce themselves and, and their organization. Henry? Thanks, Jamie. Um, my name's Henry Bruce. I'm the Director of Product at MIX, and really excited to be here and talk about the Smallholder Finance Product Explorer today. Hi everyone, I'm Anne Mastey. I'm a senior analyst at One Acre Fund, also here to present on the Smallholder Finance Product Explorer. Hi everyone, I'm Michael DeSantos. I'm the portal manager at R2I, uh, or Insight to Impact. R2I is a global resource center that seeks to improve financial inclusion through smarter use of data. Um, I'll be showcasing CGAP smallholder data through our interface. Great, thanks everybody. So let's take a quick walk through our agenda for today. We have a lot of material to share. So here's how we're gonna organize our time. First, we'll introduce you to a smallholder family with a week. We'll share a bit about their household, their needs and preferences, and then explore these data tools through the lens of their profile. We'll take a quick tour of the CGAP, Smallholder Families Data Hub, the I2I data portal, and the MIX One Acre Fund Smallholder Finance Product Explorer. As Abby said, we've set aside time to answer questions. As we go through the presentation, drop your questions, comments, ideas in that chat box on the right side. Make sure you use the drop down to select all participants so they come through to everyone. We'll collate them and respond to as many of them as, as we can at the end. But of course, we're also happy to continue this conversation after the webinar. You'll find all of our contact information at the end of the presentation, and we'd be happy to answer further questions, and especially to hear how you use the data on these tools. So feel free to reach out to us directly after the webinar. So with that in mind, let's get started. Let's start with a word about smallholder households and why they're so important to financial inclusion. There are an estimated 500 million smallholder families, representing about 2 billion people around the world. 
They rely to varying degrees on crops and livestock for their income and for food. And they may also be small business owners, traders, day laborers on other farms, and wage earners, as well as consumers, parents, pensioners, and more. Of course, what makes smallholder households distinctive is their link to agriculture, but they have many other dimensions too. They're numerous, they're diverse, and they also represent the largest client segment by livelihood, living on less than $2 a day. At TGAP, we've interacted with thousands of smallholder families through financial diaries research and nationally representative household surveys. We focus on better understanding the needs, aspirations, and behaviors of smallholder households and working with providers to offer improved financial solutions. So as we start this conversation, let's introduce you to one smallholder family we've had the opportunity to meet, then through their story and with their profile in mind, we'll explore how data on smallholder households and these three new tools can be used to generate insights and develop financial solutions relevant to clients like them. So this is Alberto and Amina and their family. They have eight children. Three of them are grown and, and living and studying on their own in a larger nearby town. And five of them, the little ones that we see here, are still at home. They've been growing cotton for 10 years, as well as maize, beans, millet, and cassava. And Alberto also generates income as a tailor. He makes more from selling their crops than he does as a tailor, but they find it useful to have multiple sources of income. They're standing here in front of the home they're building in northern Mozambique, which they want to connect to the electrical grid. So where do they buy their construction materials? Alberto goes by bicycle into town to buy nails, the roofing, and the cement. They have a radio, and Alberto likes to tune into a range of programs. He listens to music and the morning news and agricultural programs about growing cotton. Alberto and Alina don't have a bank account. When asked about it, Alberto said, I would need more money to use a bank. But they're interested in having a bank account and particularly in having a bank card. Alberto had heard of savings and credit groups, but isn't in one. he wasn't interested. He sees it as just a lot of storing money. And instead, he keeps his money at home. Alberto has a mobile phone and he's heard of mobile money, but he's not using it. He said he never sends money to anyone so he doesn't seem to see a need for it. We discussed the various ways that they could get paid when they sell their cotton, the cash payments like they get now, or digital options, or some sort of combination. But Alberto said that he would prefer to get paid for their cotton directly onto a bank card and not deal with cash. He said that the cash that they get now, it's too easy to spend, and he thinks that having a bank card would help him save money. So how might Alberto and Alina's story point to opportunities for providers to better serve them? What might data on families like theirs tell providers about potential financial solutions? Remember, of course, Alberto and Alina's story isn't the same for smallholder households everywhere. There's a lot of diversity in the sector. But we can look at their experience and begin to see the contours of one specific profile, multiple income streams, building for the future, children in school and town and at home, the awareness of banks and mobile money, but use of neither. And with this rough profile in mind, we can think from the perspective of a provider, how might we better meet their financial needs? So let's start with two questions about Alberto and Alina's financial life and the lives of smallholders like them and use our first data tool, the CGAP Data Hub, to explore some answers. So first, what are their most common expenses? What sort of regular payments are they making? Are there pain points that a financial solution can address? What aspects of these financial transactions could be easier, faster, or less expensive? And second, what sort of financial tools do they already use? Which providers do they trust? Which providers seem to have a good reputation among smallholders and which don't? Which ones have an uphill climb even with a great product? So with this in mind, let's have a look 
to see that data hub. This is a very simple tool that puts key data from the National Surveys of Smallholder Households at your fingertips. It makes looking for market opportunities in the data easy, even if you're not a data scientist. We'll briefly go over the types of data that CGAP has collected and then take a quick tour of the data hub. The data hub shares key points from the national surveys of smallholder households. These were in six countries that you see here. The data is nationally representative with a sample size of about 3,000 households in each country. The data hub also has links to data and analysis from CGAP's financial diaries with smallholder families. This is a different methodology and a different sample. The diaries were tracking household cash flows every two weeks for about a year, and they were conducted in three communities within Mozambique, Tanzania, and Pakistan. The total sample size for the diaries was about 270 families. This is also a good time to take a moment and to recognize and to thank all of CGAP's partners in our data work with smallholder households. We worked with BFA on the financial diaries and Intermedia on the national household surveys. Nathan Associates has been our partner on the deeper data analysis across both methodologies and all the markets. And Novex produced the data hub that, that we'll see here. And throughout this time, we worked closely, of course, with the National Bureau of Statistics in each of these countries. So a big thank you uh, to all of the implementing partners in this work. Okay, so back to the national surveys and the data hub. Who was in the sample? These are the listing criteria for the sample. You can see it's a combination of land and life livestock feelings and self-perception questions about the role of agriculture in the household. We cast a wide net in this very diverse livelihood. We used a relatively high ceiling for these criteria in order to get a wide range of smallholder households in the sample. And what did the questionnaire cover? A range of topics, including the agricultural activities of various household members, household demographics, attitudes and perceptions on several topics, mobile phones, and of course, financial services. So there's a lot more to say about the methodology. Uh, I'll show you where to find links on the data hub to the user guide and the questionnaires. All of that detail is there. And of course, you're welcome to shoot me a message about it. So, Let's have a look at the data hub. Great. So this is the landing page of the CGAP data hub. As you can see up here on these tabs, each country with a smallholder survey has its own tab up here. Let's go over to Mozambique. When you click on the country with the tab, you go to the data visualization of key survey data from that country. Up on top, below the countries but above the chart, you'll see these several tabs. Each tab shows a different chart of data. And if you come over here on the right, you can use these arrows to go left and right and to move the tabs and to get to the different charts. Let's have a look at this regular expenses tab. And you'll also see up on top, there's this orange gear. If you click on that, that allows you to export the chart as a PNG image or to download the data points displayed in that particular chart as an XLS or a CSV file. This comes in handy for adding charts to your presentations. And on the bottom of each chart, you'll find drop down menus. These allow you to disaggregate the data by these different variables for that particular chart. Keep an eye as you're doing that on the end size, which is down here, and you'll see a change as you disaggregate the data and narrow the sample. If you look over here at these links on the side, this is where you go if you want to dig deeper. This is where we have additional resources, the full data sets. There's a slide deck summarizing the findings, a long technical paper the methodology, questionnaires, there's a lot of detail over here on each of the surveys. Each survey has a lot more data than we present in the data hub. So if you want to go further, download the data here and you can 
do your own analysis with all of that other information behind what we see here. For Mozambique and Tanzania, if you look here, this is where we also have information about the financial diaries with smallholder families and linked to those findings as well. So let's go back to Alberto and Alina. We posed two questions to explore on the CGAP Data Hub with their profile in mind. The first one was about their most common expenses. And the second one was about the sort of financial tools they're using and which providers they trust. So let's look at expenses first. Here we are in the regular expenses tab for Mozambique. And this chart comes from a question about the financial activities that survey respondents had conducted 30 and 90 days before the moment of the survey. So this is what we see at the smallholder household level for Mozambique, a relatively low level of frequent payments. But thinking about the family's profile and with Alina in mind, let's disaggregate by gender. And we see the picture is largely the same. And if we also narrow that to what we would guess is her age range, we can see that the prevalence of school fee payments increases. And if we add mobile phone ownership to the mix, we can see school fee payments increase even further. So you see we're narrowing the sample size and we're seeing the outlines of a potentially interesting market. School fee payments look like an important financial transaction for women aged 31 to 45 and smallholder households in Mozambique who own or have access to a mobile phone like Alina. So what are the pain points here and how might an improved financial solution address them? These are the sort of questions that a provider picks up from this and then takes further knowing their market. So let's move to the second question. Which financial tools are in their portfolio and who do they trust? Let's click on the chart on financial tools. On the left side, we show where smallholders currently have an account with these formal financial mechanisms. And then on the right side, we show informal financial mechanism. Since these ones are a bit more fluid, we show use of these tools up to 90 days before the survey. Overall, it's a shallow financial portfolio among smallholder households in Mozambique. We see relative balance between more and less formal financial mechanisms. So how does this manifest in trust? What should providers know as they develop solutions. Let's move over here to this chart on trust in providers. We see that banks have the advantage on this in Mozambique. About a third of smallholders fully or somewhat trust banks. And if you're a mobile money provider, two-thirds of smallholders either don't know you or feel neutral about you. And almost one-fifth of smallholders don't trust you. You've got an uphill climb. Having a great solution, if you're a mobile money provider, is not going to be good enough. So for Alberto and Alina and other smallholders who have a mobile phone but don't use mobile money, they'll probably need more than simply a functional solution to adopt your product. This might call for a communications campaign to introduce your company and your values, maybe a stronger presentation of the value proposition, more thorough onboarding to mobile money in general might be needed, especially considering about half of smallholders don't even know these sorts of providers and, and may not be familiar with mobile money. And when customers do come on board, mobile money providers are working with a low reservoir of trust. You don't have room to make mistakes and you're vulnerable to your competitors who already have the trust of smallholders who are, who are working to build it. So this is a very quick tour through the CGAP Data Hub. We explored two questions related to Alberto and Alina's financial picture. And of course, in developing improved financial solutions, there are lots more. So to pick up two more questions and explore another smallholder data tool, let's turn to Michael from I2I. All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, hi, everyone. All right, so I'll be going through the, the R2I or Insight to Impact Data Portal 
And the, the questions that I'll be covering are the following. Um, what is Alberto and Alina's monthly income? And are families in the Nampula district saving? Um, the Nampula district, it's a province or district or jurisdiction in the northern part of uh, Mozambique. All right. Okay, so just some high-level stats on our current data portal. Um, currently, we have 20 countries or data sets across Africa and Asia. There are 29 national survey data sets on our portal, uh, seven financial diaries data sets, and six geospatial data sets. Um, the ITAR open data portal is a free open source tool, so no registration is required. Uh, we're constantly adding new data sets, so we add data sets on a monthly basis. Um, so I'm going to dive into the, the data portal now. All right, so this is uh, the website currently. You need to select the, the data portal. Once, once you land here, we need to select a country. So for this example, we need to dig further into Mozambique. So we'll select Mozambique. Um, our first question was, what is Alberto and Elena's monthly income? So for that, I'm going to use the financial diaries data type to answer. We will click there. So when you go into the, the diaries interface, you'll clearly see four financial instruments, income, credit, expenses, savings, and household and individuals tab. Um, you can toggle these on and off. So let's just bring expenses into it. And then if you do switch it on underneath, you'll see that the, whatever, you've, whatever you've selected, the timeline changes accordingly. So I've selected expenses, and then it's color-coded. So expenses being purple, orange being income. Every single line in this timeline represents a household. Um, so if you mouse over and you want to know why these financial flows dipped and spiked over a time period, you can actually just click on that line and then it will take you into a household where you can, where you can actually navigate the, um, the data. Um, but for this scenario, we're just going to view very high level uh, the, the overall household. Right, so I've, I've selected income and expenses. You can also dig further. So if you want to know, if you want to filter by sort of clothing type of expenses, you can. But for now, I'm just going to keep it high level because we need to answer the question of the monthly income. All right, so if you scroll down, based on your widgets that display underneath the timeline. Um, so there's your income by type, which I have selected. So scroll down, and then it gives you a bar chart breakdown of the four highest income tops for a month. So we can see, um, and if you mouse over, it will give you a breakdown. So blue, and the legend keys are stated underneath, so blue being agriculture. You can see in August it was quite high, but after that it kind of dips. And then October it picks up again. Um, but the, the main constant stream of income is actually casual employment, which which I think is Alberto's tailoring job. Um, that, that answers that question. And then there's, there's other stuff you can do. So you can actually dig down through individuals and you can bring down other filters. So you can filter by gender and age. and So you can disag disaggregate it quite a bit. Um, right, we're going to go into the next question, which, are, which is, are family saving in an improved district? So for that, we're going to use the national survey. All right, so this, this is a nationally representative data type. Um, when you log on, at any given time, you can change a country, so just mouse over a country. You can jump to any country, and you can go back to the actual um, country page. All right, so the first thing we want to do is bring up our own indicators. So there's a big white button, customize indicators, select that. Um, and we want to know more about savings, so we can just deactivate all these. But you guys can go in and you, if you're interested in source of income level of education, you can actually 
bring those widgets that apply to your interest. All right, so we've got savings. You can apply a filter. So if you want to know savings within a certain age group or gender or geographic area, you can apply a filter to that indicator and you can select it within context. So you, you can go past date types or future. So we work in the 2015 and we want to look at the Nampula region. So you can select or filter by a particular region. So that's, that's our choice. So that's the district Nampula in the year for the, the indicator. Um, think of this whole sort of construction is a breadcrumb, so you never lose your place on your, so the more you select, the more it kind of grows. So I've selected more indicators, so it always show me what I've chosen. All right, so I'm just gonna deactivate those guys again, keeping it simple. All right, so there's our saving widget. So for the Nampula district for 2015, or the savings indicator, 2% are saving at a bank, 2% are saving at other formal, 10% are saving informally, and nearly 40% are saving at home, which is, this is the, the, the big one, the saving at home. Within every widget, you'll have four buttons, save, change, compare, and analyze. Um, for this, for now, I'm just gonna use the compare. So I wanna compare the savings indicator to another uh, district or province within Mozambique. So I'll just select my Puto, click done, and then it gives you a nice visual um, comparison with the savings indicator. So the outer ring is Nampula, the inner ring is Maputo. And as you can see, that saving at home is still quite high, 40% in the Nampula region. Um, so through this, I've, I've gained a, quite an interesting insight. I wish to share this on social media or share it with my colleagues. You can click the Save option. Um, you can add it to your report. So if you add it to a report, it, it builds a, you build your own custom dashboard. So just select Add to Report. And then at the bottom, there'll be a report builder. So if you click on this uh, Add to Cart, there's your, there's your dashboard or widget that you've added. Um, all right, so we can just go back. If I wish to save it, I wanna share it on social media. I can choose to share. Um, two options appear, so you can either copy the URL and just go to Twitter or Facebook, whatever your preference is, and you can just tweet the, the link directly and the graphic will appear. Or if you have a CMS or a website or, and you wanna embed this widget onto your website, you can just grab the snippet of code and paste it into your, into your website and we'll paste it as, as it's seen, as it's seen, yeah. Um, if you wanna do further analysis, you can by just select the download all um, insert your email there and a link with the, the SPSS and the CSV and all the dates files and the, we'll get sent your email address where you can just download and click it. Um, so that's, I think that sits on the, the data portal side. Right, And then the next is Henry from Mix and Anne from One Acre Fund presenting the Product Explorer. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, so now we've gathered some terrific insights on our target customers. How might a provider in Mozambique create financial products that serve Alberto and Lena's family? So Mix and One Acre Fund teamed up to improve the quality and availability of operational data that helps drive product improvement. And just a quick note for those that are unfamiliar with Mix, we are a global information provider in support of financial inclusion. Our platform, Mix Market, includes data on financial institutions, agribusinesses, mobile money providers, and other actors. We are currently expanding to address information needs in sectors where financial services are the enablers of broader development goals, including 
green energy finance, fintech, and of course what we're here today to talk about smallholder finance. The Product Explorer is currently in public beta, and we believe that future releases will help reduce the financing gap for smallholder farmers. So um, on this uh, next slide, so we believe that better sharing of knowledge and information in the sector can help address two major problems that providers are currently facing. It's expensive and time consuming to test and refine smallholder finance products. And there's a lack of good quality market research on existing smallholder finance operations that can be adapted to one's own. Our intention is to make this information accessible and practical in order to inspire the creation of new products and the improvement of existing ones. We believe this unique wealth of data and the insights that can come from it will enable uh, three different verticals, providers to learn from one another much easier than before, saving money and time in the product design phase, allowing funders to identify providers with robust smallholder finance product offerings, and ultimately um, support farmers uh, in increasing the quality and availability of products that are designed for their needs. A prototype taxonomy for this knowledge base was created by the Rural and Agricultural Finance Learning Lab and One Acre Fund and refined by a nine-member working group made up of individuals with a deep knowledge of the smallholder finance sector, including Jamie from CGAP and others from Opportunity International, Vision Fund, uh, Kiva, etc. This has resulted in a rich, practically useful set of qualitative and quantitative data, which covers not only the pricing and structure of the financial product itself, but also covers add-on services, such as links to the value chain, bundle training, uh, and measures of impact of the product on farmer yield and livelihoods. And this extensive categorization allows for comparison and benchmarking of products between providers and across markets and regions. In January of this year, we launched the Smallholder Finance Product Explorer, uh, and this makes a subset of product information visible to funders and providers. And I will show you a quick, uh, very quick demo of the Smallholder Finance Product Explorer. So the landing page uh, is, our, is our jumping off point for all the information on smallholder finance uh, on mixed markets. We have links to browse profiles, uh, of those prov providers that have listed their smallholder products um, on the mixed market. We also have a summary of um, an initial, uh, some initial insights that we've gathered based on the data uh, present so far, um, submitted so far, and a comprehensive um, documentation of the taxonomy um, that you saw briefly um, on the previous slide. Looking at the organization profiles, we can browse um, those organizations that have smallholder finance products. And then we can dive into any of those um, organizations and see, in addition to a range of um, performance metrics, uh, quantitative performance metrics, um, historically hosted on mixed market, we can also see um, some, inform some highlights um, on the smallholder finance products offered by uh, an organization such as Rosasa. Um, and then below uh, the um, financial data table, we see here um, the five uh, different smallholder products that Wasasa offers. And in the table, uh, the, uh, a subset, as I say, of the quantitative and qualitative data um, on those products. And so um, the same um, it may exist for, for other organizations. Um, Proximity and First Valley Bank have been um, great supporters in, in our, first, uh, first, for our first release. Um, and we look forward to working with them and others to uh, continue to um, update and, and add to this um, extensive data set. Just one quick note that uh, it is necessary to log in uh, to Mixed Market to see all of this smallholder information. So if you haven't registered for free um, previously on Mixed Market, please do so. Uh, and if you haven't recently logged in, please do log in to get access to all of that data. So now we're going to show you um, how future releases of the Smallholder Finance Product Explorer will be able to be used by providers to design farmer-centric products. Uh, 
if we go back to uh, a couple of questions, uh, a couple of example questions along those lines, um, we might ask what kind of product should we design for our target clients um, and what other product features could we include to increase the impact on their livelihood. So no, no, using what we now know about um, Alberto and Alina's financial lives and based on some of the demand side data sets we've explored, and we'll now walk you through how you could use the information in the Smallholder Finance Product Explorer to inform product development. Thanks, Henry. So um, we've seen from the CGAP data that school fees are a really important financial activity in the lives of uh, farmers like Alberto and Alina. And We've also gone to the ITI data portal and we've analyzed the savings patterns from the financial diaries, which have shown us that there seems to be uh, a drop in savings uh, accumulated uh, in, in October. So if we know that the financial goal of our target client is to save money for children's secondary school fees, for example, um, and how can we kind of use all that information to draw up a high level a framework for a type of product that might meet their needs. So let's say that we know that maize planting season in Mozambique starts in October, which means that perhaps our clients will be using their savings that they've accumulated in September to purchase those inputs. Well, that means that there's not a lot of savings left over in January when those school fee payments are due. So as a financial service provider, perhaps we're thinking, if Alberto and Alina had access to a credit product that helped them purchase those inputs in September, that they could then pay off gradually through uh, other sources of income like their tailor uh, business, perhaps then they could save the savings that they have for January for those school fee payments. So we can use the product explorer and what we know about our client and the analysis of the demand side data to start generating examples of products that might suit the needs of clients like Alberto and Alina. So for example, we know that outside of cotton, they grow mainly staple crops. So we can search through the product explorer according to commodity. We also know that they have multiple sources of income, each with distinct timing and distinct cash flows. So we may want to search through the product explorer to find examples of products that offer flexibility in their structure and in their repayment uh, schedule. And this is really unique because it gives insight into how different providers are building flexibility into their products. And that's a level of information and insight that you just can't get anywhere else. So we also saw from the CGAP smallholder families data that trust in savings groups amongst Alberto and Alina's age segment is lower than trust in formal financial uh, institutions. So perhaps we'd like to search through the product explorer for examples of products that are delivered directly to individuals rather than uh, using a group lending methodology. Demand side data also has shown us that Mozambican smallholders within Alberto and Alina's age group have relative trust in agents. And we also know that Alberto in the past has used mobile money to receive money. So we can maybe narrow our search criteria down to find examples of products that make use of this mobile channel or make use of agents. Again, this level of data and insight is unique and it offers an easy way to explore and compare the diversity of delivery models that providers are using to reach rurally based populations. Finally, we know that Alberto and Alina are diligent savers, but that they don't think that they have enough money to save at a formal institution. So we can look for examples of credit products that include a bundled savings feature in order to encourage our client's savings habits. So based on these few pieces of information that we've gathered through the analysis of the demand side data, we've sketched an outline of the types of products that might suit Alberto and Alina's needs. So the product explorer can then produce examples of products that correspond to the criteria we've set. So for instance, here, the search may provide us with an example of an Ethiopian microfinance institution that's offering an agricultural loan to maize farmers. And as you can see, this is just a snapshot, but the product explorer provides both quantitative and qualitative information 
within each category and subcategory. And so you can see that we get a really deep level of detail on different smallholder finance products. On this slide, we're looking at a snapshot of the financial structure and pricing category. And so you can see that, the or, the, that organizing the data into this framework that we designed allows for the comparison between products. If you would like to learn more about uh, the different data fields that are included in our product explorer uh, and see kind of the level of detail that we go into, you can go back to our landing page and download the taxonomy document. And you can look through the full list of available fields in the annex. And the taxonomy document also outlines the process that we follow to develop this framework with the help of our working group. So let's say we've piloted this new product within one of our districts, but uptake was lower than expected. So we went out and we spoke to clients, we did some research, and we identified these three key challenges that may be contributing to clients' reluctance to take on a loan. So what other product features could we include to increase the uptake of our product, but also increase the impact on our clients' livelihoods? So again, we can search through the Product Explorer and select examples of products that include, for instance, agronomic training, because we know that providing training to clients can help increase the adoption of good farming practices, such as fertilizer application. Users can also search for products with a number of different insurance offerings bundled up, including agricultural-related insurance. And we can also search for examples of products where FSPs are involved in the sourcing and the delivery of inputs, or they've partnered with another organization to facilitate that access to inputs. So we can actually search through a number of different pre-harvest support configurations. So similar to the previous example, the Product Explorer then produces results according to our search criteria. So in this case, we see that we've pulled an example of an input loan from a provider in Ghana. And then we can get into the detailed information on the structure of these additional pre- and post-harvest support services. So for example, this provider is directly involved in the sourcing, delivery, and quality control of the inputs, and the cost of this service is rolled up in the pricing structure of the product. Again, the Product Explorer is truly unique in that we can discover product design features and add-on services that, had we perhaps not seen it done successfully elsewhere, we may not have ever considered offering to our own clients. This particular provider also um, uh, provides post-harvest support in the form of facilitated on-farm storage. And again, you can see detail on that service. And then in this search, remember that we wanted to also see examples of products that offer agronomic training to clients. So for this input loan, the provider in Ghana has partnered with an external organization or organizations for the delivery of training rather than directly providing that service themselves. So this level of detail is invaluable because then we can compare and contrast different products, different services, business models in a way that helps us make key business decisions. And in the last category, users can also access information about the approach different providers are taking to measuring the impact of products on farmer yields and on income. So this offers providers the opportunity to learn from each other about how to embed uh, measurement metrics into core business processes. So we've just demonstrated one potential use case for the Product Explorer, but there are many other questions that can be answered through this tool for both funders and for providers. So for example, funders can use this resource when deciding to invest in a new market to identify providers that are serving smallholder farmers there, or providers can use the insights that they're gathering from the product explorer to make the case internally for the improvement of an existing financial product or the development of a new financial product targeting a specific segment. But we also want to hear from you, so please do get in touch to share your ideas on how this tool could best work for your own product design needs within your own organization. With that, I will pass it back to Jamie to wrap up uh, the uh, webinar and go to questions. Great. Thanks, Anne. And as you said, here's the, the links to all of the different opportunities, these three portals. 
that we've covered, so go check them out and then come back to us with any questions. We've got our contact information on the next slide, I believe. We've had a very active chat box. There's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of questions, and, and that's great. We will do our best to pick up a couple of them now, and uh, and then, of course, we're welcome, uh, we welcome more conversation and more discussion about this outside of the webinar. So I'll answer a couple of the ones that came up about the CDAP Data Hub. The first one was, does CDAP plan to continue to add to the Data Hub with new data sets over time? And the answer to that would be, the, the first part is that CDAP does not plan to do more national surveys of smallholder households at this moment. Uh, that said, this is why we were so careful about, about documenting and sharing the methodology and the questionnaires and that everything that anyone else would be able to do to just sort of pick up and to do something very similar. Of course, tailoring it to, to your specific needs and the, and the questions that you might have. But for example, for big bilaterals and multilaterals that are making major investments with a, a partner government in a particular country or market, and if they're looking for a baseline questionnaire, then that's, a, that's at least a reference point to, to pick up the questionnaires that we've developed and adapt to their needs. If it should happen that there's a, there, there's a, a similar data set that fits in with this data set, we'd be happy to add it to the data hub, but I think that's also a good question for, for Michael as well about how I2I is adding data sets to their platform. So we'll come to that in a second when we turn over to Michael. The second question that I'll answer about the CDAP data hub was about how, how this data hub helps us understand smallholder households outside of the countries that are focused on here, outside of these six national survey countries or the three markets where we have the financial diaries data, where does that, where does that take us? And then from a provider's point of view, often providers say, as come up here, you know, there's limited internal capacity for a lot of data analytics work, consumer research, designing products. So, you know, when an inspiration that comes from a data tool like this, where, where do, provider's turn, where can they take this sort of information? So a couple quick points on that. The first one would be, you're the expert on your market. So consider your market, consider the clients that you're targeting, the solution that you're developing. See what might echo across the data that we have, if there's a similar market, a similar client profile, and see where those generate insights. I would also suggest check out the work that, that we and that others have done on segmenting smallholder households, where we can see profiles of smallholder households where we start to see these archetypes, the portfolio that they're using, the sort of agricultural activities that they're engaged in, the other household livelihood, income generating activities, and how, how that manifests in other markets, how providers are relating to them, and where that might give insight on what might work for the clients that you're targeting in your market. The second point I'll make on that is look for other data sources. Think about the data that you already have in in house. What do you have that you're that you're sitting on inside your four walls that could be analyzed and operationalized? How can you improve the data that you're collecting to onboard and and serve customers and outside your organization? In addition to the data that we're presenting here, what other data sources already exist? Other household survey data, LSMS and ag survey data, the financial inclusion insights, the FINDEX. There's a whole universe of data out there beyond the, the snapshot that we see here that could be relevant as we think about the markets beyond this picture. And then when it comes to when it comes to operationalizing these in, these insights, think about what are the what are the sort of local resources that you can reach out to as well. It could be market facilitators like the network of FSDs. There's often strong technical teams in some of the bilaterals and multilaterals and and other, other organizations that are very active in the sector. There's a great network of local consulting firms with expertise who know the market, who know the players, and they're often well positioned to offer great strategic and technical support. And if, if you need some, some links or connections, I'm sure any of us here would be happy to make introductions as, as, as might be relevant. So, I'll just answer those questions about the, the CGAP Data Hub quite quickly. And of course, happy to have more conversations about that. 
Let's turn to you, Michael, and pose a couple of questions about the I2I portal. So the first one for you is how do we know, a question came up, how can we know where the data displayed is coming from? And how can we better understand the population being discussed? For example, are we talking about a smallholder population versus all adults? And is there a way to standardize populations across indicators to ease comparison? So this is the first question. And then the, the second one about the portal is, are there plans to add additional countries? All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, all right, so on the first question, so we get our data from multiple data owners. So it's Finscope. Um, we, we, yeah, so CGAP, um, central banks. Yeah, so there's a whole list of uh, data owners that we do get data from. With the, the population, so what we tried to do was to list it clearly, the sample size on top of our interface. So if it is nationally represented by adults, we'll clearly stipulate that on top, um, just be, or just above the breadcrumbs. Um, all our percentages are based on that population. And it is a bit, so the percentages, be it adult population or segmented by farmers, um, it works on a percent. Um, for, for bringing in other data sets, we'll, we're currently cleaning lots of data sets. So and the next release is going to happen in the next, or I'm hoping in the next few weeks. Um, another 14 countries should get released um, in, within two to three weeks, let's, let's call it three weeks. Um, but yeah, so it's an on, ongoing search for, for data, um, creating these relationships with data owners and, and getting the data on our platform. Um, Great. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for fielding those. And now we'll throw out in a few minutes we have left. There's a, a few questions, of course, for Henry and Anne. There's a, a question about when future releases of the Product Explorer are going to become available. There was another question asking about if there's any data on impact specifically for the different products developed by One Acre Fund. And another question about how the Product Explorer overlaps or, or might compare with other sources of information on smallholder financial products and services, such as the one offered by Raffle, the Rural and Ag Finance Learning Lab. So, Henry and Anne, over to you. Thanks, Jamie. So, um, let me take the first question and uh, I'll maybe touch briefly on uh, on the RAF, Raffle uh, data, data set. Um, so, the way that we are approaching the smallholder finance Finance Product Explorer is for it to be um, an ongoing product uh, as part of mixed market, and um, we will we will always be making uh, a certain amount of information uh, available for free. So uh, there was a question about um, paying to access uh, uh, this data. This data is accessible for free. Uh, registration uh, on mixed market is free, so we encourage uh, all of you to do that to get access to this data. Um, Future releases are, are in progress. As this is a product development activity, uh, the, the, it does take a, a while to coordinate all the actors. We want to make sure that um, we um, provide the right, uh, the right kind of balance across um, the providers providing the information and, and those uh, consuming it to uh, to support this as an ongoing um, activity. Uh, so, uh, and, and this, this data set uh, grows and, and we can leverage the, the value in that, uh, in, in the scale um, and, uh, uh, and uh, that, that data is, is, is consistently um, kind of up to date. Um, so we're working with um, funders at the moment and investors uh, and providers to build out that data set um, uh, and provide additional features. So we don't have any, um, can't share any specific timeframes at the moment, but encourage you to stay uh, stay in touch, uh, send us an email, um, or, or we'll check back on a, on a frequent basis to to, um, to see what new providers um, are added to the mix. <laughs> so um, on the RAF uh, Learning Lab data set, so yes, this this will um, consume um, all of that data sets. We, they will be handing over 
um, their data to us and we will be standardizing that um, as per the taxonomy um, and, and publishing that on mixed market um, over the course of 2018. Um, so expect the number of organizations and the, and the products for those organizations to grow over that time and you'll see that number um, listed in the um, in the search uh, filters on the right hand side of the organization profile pages on mixed market. And just to jump in to answer the question specifically about data on the impact for One Acre Fund products. So yes, we will be uploading data for One Acre Fund products specifically in Kenya and Rwanda, or starting with Kenya and Rwanda shortly. Um, and look out for that both on the Product Explorer uh, page, but also wanted to mention that for more detailed information about our methodology, um, you know, how we track impact, you can also always go to the oneacrefund.org website and under the impact rubric, we have more detailed information about impact methodology and any reports or research results that we've published are also available there. And then one last thing to mention that's uh, connected to the question about the RAF Learning Lab data set and how we'll be kind of feeding that into uh, the Product Explorer. Wanted to mention that we are about to release our second insights brief uh, on our landing page, so do check back uh, later this week. And in that insights brief, we're outlining the approach that we're taking to expanding the underlying data set. So stay tuned for that, and you can also follow Mix and One Acre Fund on Twitter uh, we generally uh, update uh, uh, or send out updates via social media, Twitter, LinkedIn. Great. Thanks, Anne and Henry. There's um, a great conversation that's still to be had. There's more questions that we see in the chat box, and we look forward to continued engagement and exploration and more ideas from all of you. You can see all of our contact information over here, and, and we look forward to hearing from you and continuing this, this work together. Abby, over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, I thank you to Jamie, Michael, Henry, and Anne for sharing these incredibly useful tools and data sets. Now we'd like to hear quickly from all of the webinar participants to get your feedback. If you can please take a brief moment to respond to the poll question, which will appear in your WebEx window on the right-hand side. And finally, just before we close, I wanted to mention what's next. As I mentioned in the beginning, the recording from this webinar and the presentation will be available on the Microfinance Gateway website within a few days. And we will send a follow-up email with the recording to all of those who registered for the webinar. Please feel free to share this with your network. And finally, we invite you to our upcoming Gateway webinars. The link to the webinar page should appear in your chat box as I'm speaking. Our next one is on May 15, called Microfinance, Revolution or Footnote? Microfinance over the next 10 years, where we will explore important questions about the future of microfinance. And then on May 24, we will be hosting a webinar with the Gateway Academy entitled Making the Case for Digital Learning which should be very relevant to your institutions as we will discuss capacity development challenges and priorities for financial institutions and the digital learning value proposition for learners and employers. Once again, a big thank you to the presenters and to all of you who joined the webinar for your questions and engagement on the topic. Thank you very much. <laughs>